happy today to have uh, Professor uh, Datu Ahmad Adam, uh, who is the Emeritus Professor of History. Uh, this is the Emeritus of History at the UKM. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yes. Okay. So uh, he, we are very honored because uh, yeah. Prof. Ahmad Adam is going to speak to us on the Hikayat Melayu. The Raffles uh, Manuscript Number 18. Uh, asking this very interesting question, was it written in Aceh? We all know that this is uh, one of the most important manuscripts on, Malaysia, uh, on, in, on Malaysian history, the early part of Malaysian history. And Raffles uh, Manuscript 18 has been published. It was published in 1938 uh, with, uh, by Winstead. Uh, in the uh, Journal of the Malaysian Branch of the Royal Aesthetic Society, uh, the Society's Journal. And so today, uh, Prof. Uh, Ahmad Dam is going to ask this, uh, trying to answer whether or not this was written in Aceh. Now, of course, the Achenese uh, uh, connection has always been very real because of the wars that uh, took place and because of that, uh, a, a, a large group of the Malay Malaccan uh, elites were actually taken over to Aceh. So therefore, uh, quite a lot of the work has been done, um, not in Malacca, but mainly uh, in Aceh perhaps, or perhaps elsewhere. So this is what uh, we are here for. And we are very glad that uh, Prof. Ahmad Adam has uh, consented to speak uh, to us today. Uh, the Society uh, has a series of talks, and today uh, this is the topic, but we do uh, organize talk on various parts of the Malaysian history. Now, Prof. Ahmad Adam is someone who requires very little introduction, and uh, he, is, uh, he was for many years uh, um, the, a professor of history at University Kebangsaan Malaysia, and, uh, and also dean. And after that, when uh, upon uh, the setting up of the University of Malaysia Sabah, he moved over to Sabah to become the dean of the Center for the Promotion of Knowledge and uh, language uh, and languages. Uh, so, and then upon retirement, he was also here for a while at the University of Malaya, and then uh, now he has uh, fully retired. And but then he is still very much active, uh, active part of our uh, academic uh, circle. And he is also a fellow at the, of the Academy of Sciences Malaysia. And apart from that, he is also a long-standing council member of the uh, Membras. So I think without further much ado, I will pass the time over to Prof. Ahmad Adam. Uh, for those of you who are online, uh, we just hope that if you cannot hear us, uh, please let us know. Uh, but for, for those who are here, we are very uh, Grateful that you are able to come today. Uh, we this this turnout is actually uh, beyond our uh, what expectation because normally Saturday afternoon we don't expect a lot of people to come. We expect more people there, but I think the numbers are competing now. <laughs> yeah, Prof. Thank you. Thank you, Danny, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, in this short lecture, I propose to discuss the origins of the Raffles Manuscript Number no. 18, popularly known as Sejarah Melayu. Everybody knows Sejarah Melayu. But actually, the original name of the Sejarah Melayu what in English is called the Malay Annals, was the Hikayat Melayu, the Malay narrative or Malay story. It was Stanford Raffles who popularized the name Sejarah Melayu after he received a letter from the Datuk Sri Pikramaraja, the Wazir of Raja of Siak in 1810. The Wazir or Prime Minister of the Sultan of Siak named the manuscript the Secharah Melayu, Sejarah Melayu. For over two centuries, the original name Hikayat Melayu was forgotten. It was instead called the Sejarah Melayu by the European Orientalists. The first person who copied the Malay manuscript bearing the name of the Sejarah Melayu was Ibrahim bin Kandu 
a Chilean Tamil from Penang. He was probably requested to do so in 1807 by Stamford Raffles, who arrived in Penang in September 1807, where he served as the assistant secretary of Philip Dundas, the East India Company lieutenant governor of the island. Apart from the Hikayat Melayu, best known as the Raffles Manuscript number 18, the Raffles collection also consists of the Raffles number 35, 39, 68, and the Raffles 18. There is, however, another early version of the manuscript that was copied in 1798 in Malacca. Other well-known versions are the ones copied by or for Abdullah Munshi, John Layden, and Shalabar. At the Russian Oriental Manuscript Institute in St. Petersburg, there is a copy which I have studied. This is the manuscript that was copied in Malacca in 1798. It is in fact the earliest copy to be made. The names of the copies were Haji Muhammad Tahir Al-Jawi, Muhammad Zakat Long, and Ibrahim Jamrud. They copied it for the German-born Russian naval officer Ivan, oh, Ivan Fyodorovich Krusenstern. We think that the oldest surviving copy of the Hikayat Melayu is the Raffles manuscript number 18. But due to interpolations made by the copies, which probably happened after the 1530s, the original manuscript which had the narrative of the Portuguese defeat of Malacca in 1511 as its last chapter had seen the additional chapters being added to it. You see, in that uh, the last chapter that was copied in Archie was uh, regarding the defeat of Malacca by the Portuguese. This manuscript is now known as the Raffles 18, which is a copy of the original copy. However, the origins of this version of the Millie Annals have not been satisfactorily studied by scholars. The failure of Winston and others in reading the old Jawi script of the Raffles manuscript number 18 correctly has contributed to the misreading and misinterpretation of the text of the Sejarah Melayu. In my latest study of the Hikayat Melayu, I have exposed this failure of scholars reading old Jawi used in the classical Malay manuscripts. <coughs> Weaknesses of previous studies. Previous scholars have not read the Jawi script. This is my opinion. Previous scholars have not read the Jawi script in the manuscript correctly. For example, the word kaid, which is spelled in Jawi, kayadal or K-Y-D, uh, it has been pronounced as kida, which is not kida, it's kaid, it's a Persian word. Then S-P-R-B is not supraba, it's not sapurba, which has been pronounced or read by many for maybe over 200 years. Is actually Supraba. And Supraba is another name for the Buddha. Then the, the, the spelling Alif Kapra, which is A-K-R or Akar, is not Akar, but it's Agra, not Akar. Because in Jawi, in Old Jawi, the, the letter Kaf, K, can take place, can be taken, can also be read as Ga. So, a K A R could be A G R E. Then the the the, the spelling Amarta. Actually, there's a correct pronunciation. It's not Amarat, which has been pronounced for maybe two hundred years. Amarat. There's no such thing such word as Amarat. It's Amarta. It's a Sanskrit word. Almost all previous scholars failed to notice the presence of an unusual method of spelling Malay words or what is known as hypercorrection, according to the Archidist spelling method. This is uh, uh, regarding the manuscript number 18. Past researchers also fail to understand and explain why Sufi mysticism was employed in the writing of manuscripts. Another weakness 
is the failure to recognize the non-Malay elements in the Raffles manuscript number 18, such as the significant presence of old Javanese or Kawi words. In fact, when I use, when I mention about this, one French scholar called it barbaric because he doesn't understand Javanese. The mispronunciation and misspelling of such words in the Jawi script and the inability of the copies in recognizing that they are not native Malay words have contributed to this misunderstanding. Until today, not many people realize that Pada Hari Pirtuturan are actually Kawi words or old Javanese words. The Pirtuturan is, is a mispronunciation of Pituturan. An old Javanese word. Most glaring mistakes that are noticed by uh, this writer or this speaker are known to many previous scholars studying the Malay annals, particularly the Raffles Manuscript number 18, which was first started by Sir Richard Winston and published in 1938. The written text of the manuscript was actually very much influenced by the Archinist style of writing. This was not known to all the scholars who have studied the Raffles Malay manuscript number 18. One glaring example of the presence of the Archinist literary influence is the hyper correct spelling form found in the Raffles manuscript number 18 and several other copies of the Hikayat Melayu. This is all due to the misreading of the old Jawi script. From chapter 1 until the 23rd chapter of the Raffles manuscript number 18, the Archinist influence is shown. Besides the unique hypercorrection of the spelling of words, there are also other forms of influences. It is our belief that the manuscript written in Archi only had 23 chapters found in the Raffles manuscript number 18. It, it could also be less, or, but not more. It could be less because uh, due to interpolation or changes made by copies, we don't really know how many chapters. Chapter 23 describes the victory of the Portuguese. This is the correct chapter found in the Archinist copy. And it ends with the fictional death of Sultan Ahmad and Tun Ali Hati. This is my interpretation that the death of Sultan, Ham Sultan Ahmad, son of Sultan Mahmud, and Tun Ali Hati is fictional. It was written uh, by the writer in Aceh who was influenced, uh, who was inspired by the Hikayat Raja, Raja Pasai. Because in the Hikayat Raja Pasai, there's this character, uh, the story of Ton Brain Bapa, whose death in the, in the Hikayat Raja Pasai is about, uh, was brought about by his father, uh, the Sultan of Pasai. Sultan Ahmad. Aceh, during the early decades of the 16th century, was famous as a center of literary writing. So the Sultan of Aceh then was Ali Moghayat Shah. His reign was from 1496 to 1528, but officially it was around 1514 to 1528. His successor was his son, Sultan Salahuddin. 1528 to 1537, and followed by Alauddin Al-Kahar, 1537 to 1568. Even though the main language used was Malay, the Archinist style of writing was very dominant. The presence of the so-called hypercorrection method in the spelling of words, Archinist vocabulary, and also Archinist Sufi concepts, as well as the religious symbolism, were the distinct forms of Archinist culture employed in the writing of the Malay Annals, the Sejarah Melayu, or Hikayat Melayu. As a general rule of the thumb, it seems that Malay words who last sil uh, whose last syllables end with the vowels A, E, E, U, and O, this is the Archinese style of uh, spelling, will have the consonant H or H added to the final syllable. Thus, the word Baginda, which means uh, His Majesty, will be spelled as Baginda because the, vo the vowel A or A has the consonant H added to it. So Baginda 
will be spelled as Baginda. Ananda. Ananda will be spelled as Ananda. And Bonda, meaning mother, will be spelled as Bonda. Because of this ruling on the need to add the consonant Ha in the last syllable of Malay words, many scholars studying the Sejarah Melayu have misread the Achenese word Sogo. So that's why you find in the Raffles Manuscript 18, the word Orang Kaya Sogo. Because many people, all these past researchers thought that Sogo is another name. Actually, Sogo, that's the original name, with the H added, becomes Sogo. And Sogo means district or village or, or territory. And that's why Sogo has been pronounced as Sogo, which leads to mistake. Another example of hypercorrection is the substitution of the consonant S, sir, with the phoneme sh. So this is another artist phenomenon. If the word has an S, that S will be substituted with sh, as why. In such words as kebesaran or besar becomes besar. Kebesar, kebesaran becomes kebesaran. And sahaya will be spelled as shahaya. Sama will become shama. And saudaraku will be spelled as saudaraku. This form of hypercorrection has also been largely ignored by previous scholars of the Raffles Manuscript number 80. But of course, if you read the manuscript, it's not on every page that these words have been changed. You know? uh, because the writer, especially the writer of the copies of the manuscript number 18, sometimes he will copy only some. And some also be copied by the copies of the uh, text but in Abdul Munshi. Though not all words will be changed. Another influence that is uh, seen is the, the, the presence of Sufi mysticism. This is found in all texts of the Sejarah Melayu, although people misread it. An example of Sufi influence is the dating of a manuscript. That's why in the Hikayat, in, in the Hikayat Melayu or Raffles manuscript number 18, you find the date 12 Rabiul Awal, which is also in the Abdul Munshi's text and the Shalabes text. It's written supposedly on 12 Rabiul Awal. Believed, this date is believed by Sufis as the birth date of Prophet Muhammad. The Archinists also have high regard for Thursday. Then the text of the Sejarah Melayu is often said to be written on Thursday. Except for the Raffles Manuscript number 18. And the, the, the copies wrote there, written on Sunday. But this is an interpolation. It's not the original. The original date and day is 12 Rabiul Awal, Thursday, regardless of the date or the day. Thursday is regarded as an auspicious holy day in Islamic belief. The naming of a particular year based on a particular huruf, the letter, the Arabic letter, because of the sophistic belief shared by Malays and Archinese that the eight Arabic letters, namely Alif, Ha, Jim, Zai, Dal, Ba, Wow, and the letter Del, Dal, have mystical numerical values. All these eight Arabic letters, actually seven, but it's they, they have to add another one. So that's why you have the letter Dal or letter Zai to make it eight, you know. There's a reason for making eight. The said hurufs or letters are prescribed in the form of the formula Ah, just the Buddha. So Alif, Ha, Jim, Zai, Dal, Ba, Wow, Dal. So Dal, is repeated again. There's a second dal. So the the, the said hurus become ah just the Buddha. There's the formula. Malays and Archinists name the eight years calendar cycle. The eight is chosen as the calendar cycle, the eight year calendar cycle. So in other words, every after eight years you begin a new cycle. The little daur, the cycle is called daur, 
Well, the Japanese call their calendar cycle window. The Japanese also believe in the eight year cycle, but they call it window. The Malays and the Archinese call it down. It's an Arabic word. Each cycle is determined by seven Quranic letters, like I said just now. Seven Quranic letters, but to make it eight, they make it a second dal or second jim. And the seven Quranic letters are based on the mnemonic Ah, just the Buddha. That is the Alif, Ha, Jim, Zai, Dal, Ba, and Wow. And each letter, each Arabic letter has a value, numerical value. Alif is one, Ha is five, Jim is three, Zai is seven, Dal is four. And in the case of the Raffles manuscript number 18, is Tahun Dal, the year of Dal. So the value is four. And Ba is two, because it's the second letter. Wow is six. In the Archinese and Malay cycle, the Daur, a second letter is added, namely Dal, to complete the eight-year cycle. Otherwise, only seven letters. So to make it eight, they have to make it the second Dal. In the Japanese window, the second letter added would be Jim. So there's a second Jim or letter Jim. Why number eight in Shism symbolizes the eight gates of heaven? This is a symbol. In the Chinese belief also, eight is a holy number. The number eight is a holy number in, in Buddhism, Chinese belief. Each huruf has an exotic numerical value of, like I said just now, Alif is one, Ha is five, Jim is three, Zai is seven, Dal is four, Ba is two, and Wow is six. To determine which huruf fits the name of a particular year, the Hijri year or the Hijrah year, it should be divided by eight. For example, the year 1021 Hijrah, according to the Raffles Manuscript 18, when divided by eight, we leave a remainder of five. In the order of Archinese Malay cyclical calendar, the fifth huruf is the letter Dal. The number five. The letter Dal is number five. But the first Dal has a value of four. That's in the Raffles manuscript number 80. The copies writes the name of the year as Tahun Dal Awal. Dal Awal means the first Dal, not the second Dal. The Archinese had a long history of literary tradition. The first famous work that had a strong influence on the Malay annals was the Hikayat Raja Pasai. When somebody wrote the Sejarah Melayu or the Hikayat Melayu or the uh, Malay annals, he was that writer, the unknown writer, was inspired partly by the Hikayat Raja Pasai, which was written in Aceh, in Pasai. There was also a strong Persian influence in the writing of Archinese works. The two famous translated works from Persian were the Hikayat Muhammad Anafiyah. This was based on the Persian manuscript. And the Hikayat Amir Hamza. And these works were written in the middle of the 14th century. On the eve of the Portuguese invasion, these works, these works were mentioned as having inspired the elite in the palace to read them. Sultan Ahmad advised the chiefs of Malacca to read these two manuscripts because the manuscripts were already written during the time of Malacca. Translation of the Persian work, Hikayat Bayan Puriman, this is very famous. Uh, it is still read by students in schools, Hikayat Bayan Puriman, by Kadi Hassan, sometime between 1590 and 1600. The work was narrated earlier in about 1371 or 1372. Towards the end of the 16th century, Hamza Fansuri, the Archinese writer, emerged as a Chinese-born Archinese born writer, who was the original Archinese. This was followed by Shamsuddin Pasai early in the 17th century. Two other famous 17th century Archinese works written based on the original Persian are the Tajus Salatin, meaning the crown of kings, by Buhari al-Johari, 1603. 
and the Bustan Salatin, written by Nuruddin Araniri from India, actually, in 1638. The first original Archinese work was the Hikayat Archi. It was also written in early 17th century. In the same period, also saw the writing of Hikayat Hang Tua being started. You see, the word, the first word, Tua, when people talk about Hikayat Hang Tua, it was used in the Hikayat Archi, 17th century. And that was the first, the first time the writer of the Hikayat Archi introduced it. So in order to explain to, to explain to the readers, he had to mention the original word meaning Tua, fortune, which was Tua Bagia. Because the, there was no Tua word before the 17th century. And that's why people are angry with me when I say Hang Tua didn't exist. It was this, the, the pseudonym was Hang Tua. So, Hikayat Hang Tuha was actually also written in Archie. I mean, some European writers mentioned that the, the Hikayat Hang Tuha was written in, in Johor or uh, outside, not outside Johor, in Johor. But actually, it's written in Archie. Besides the Archie's influence, the meticulous reader will also come across many old Javanese or Kawi words. If you read the text of the Sejarah Melayu or the Raffles Manuscript number 18, there are so many Javanese words which one scholar, as I said, and a French scholar didn't believe in, he called my work on that as Barbary. My study of the rereading of the Raffles Manuscript number 18 had left me convinced that the writing of the Hikayat Melayu or Malay Annals, is not only influenced by old Javanese or Kawi words, but also by the Achenese way of writing, especially with the heavy influence of hypercorrection in the spelling of words. Nevertheless, it seems that Javanese, has, has, Javanese influence has also been ignored by, by many researchers. Javanese influence in the Hikayat Melayu was very much evident in the early period of its writing. The spread of works in Javanese language and literature in the Malay archipelago, the Nusantara region, between 1277 and 1400, a result of Javanese military and cultural invasions affecting Sumatra and the peninsula, has certainly influenced the Malay language. Unfortunately, unfortunately, scholars studying classical Malay manuscripts have not raised any interest regarding it or question its presence in this generally. The first evidence of the influence of Javanese words can be seen from the Batu Busra Tranganu, the Tranganu inscription. And I raise the issue, not many people believe me. Among the classical Javanese works found to have influenced the classical Malay literary writing were the Pandi stories, namely the Hikayat Chekel Waning Pati, Ikayat Panji Sumerang and several others, such as the translated versions of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. During the Majapahit era between 1300 and late 1400, the Pandit tales were also making an impact on Malay language and literature. A good example of the Kawi influence can be seen from the words inscribed on the Tranganu, uh, Tranganu stone, Tranganu inscription. As was mentioned earlier, not many people acknowledge the influence of the old, Jav old Javanese or Kawi language found in the Sejarah Melayu. Now, can the presence of Javanese influence shed any light on the authorship of the Sejarah Melayu? Who was the author of the Malay Annals? The Kawi words, Pada Hari Pirtuturan, had been wrongly read and transliterated by many people to mean we request that the Hikayat a narrative be composed by the Bandahara concerning the conversations of Malay Rajas. So, the researchers have been reading Pada Hari as uh, to be written by Bandahara about the regulations of Malay rulers.
Some don't even make sense of the reading. For example, one local scholar transliterated the pada hari pertuturan as pada bendahara pertutur perturun segala raja. Actually, the three words pada hari pertuturan are Kawi words, so old Javanese words. The Kawi word pituturan origin is from tutur, meaning to obey. That's the meaning of tutur, to obey. Pituturan is to obey, to follow, to inform, to remind, to make conscious, to bring into realization, to remember or to advise. Pada hari are also Kawi words. They're not Malay words. Then, Another version is pada hari in Kawi or Old Javanese. It means the way to persuade. Pada hari, the way to persuade. In its literal sense, the words pada hari pituturan would mean to advise the family members by persuasive means. That is, by making them happy to listen as it would give them a pleasant feeling and so it would persuade them to listen to the advice given. Could the Kawi words pada hari pituturan found in the Raffles manuscript number 18 have been written in Malacca? Were these words written in Malacca before the arrival of the Portuguese? In the Kawi language, hari, ari or hari are terms of address either for the distant relatives or the non-family members of the aristocrats. Another meaning of hari is to calm down or to entertain. There are several meanings to the word pada. It can mean all, it can also mean similar or district. It also refers to the word to the world or universe, region, heaven, way or feet, even feet. Could the writer who left Malacca for Aceh after the Portuguese conquest be a Javanese? Or could he be a person of mixed blood? Or perhaps one who was very knowledgeable in Kawi, old, old Javanese language, and Javanese literature. Nonetheless, we suspect that he was someone who was not only proficient in old Javanese, but he was also proficient in the Achenese language. It is possible that the parts in the annals that clearly show the presence of Javanese influence must have been written either during the period of Sultan Mansur Shah's reign, 1459-1477, or according to his said, much later. Did the author leave Malacca after the collapse of the Malacca Sultanate? Was the Javanese influence more dominant than Achenese influence in the, RF, in the Refus manuscript number 80? If one were to read the manuscript with intense scrutiny, one would without doubt recognize the Achenese influence in the Raffles Manuscript number 18, is much more dominant. Although the Raffles Manuscript number 18 is not the original copy of the Malay Annals or the Hikayat Melayu, little attention is given to its historical origins. Many past scholars did not realize that the manuscript is very different from the other versions of the Malay Annals. Due to their failure in, re in reading the Jawi script correctly, they also failed to recognize the Achenese way of writing, and also its linguistic influence. Now, how did the Achenese influence occur? Sultan Mahmud Shah and his family members, including his son Sultan Ahmad, had reportedly made their journey to Pago, but near Moa, Bentayan, before going to Pahang, and then moving on later to Bintan in early 1530. It appears that their initiative to leave Malacca was followed by probably some other members of the Malacca elite. At least one of them appeared to have left for Aceh to seek refuge. Following the victory of the Portuguese army in August 1511, there was an attempt by many members of the Sultanate's elite to follow the example of Sultan Mahmud Shah and his family members who left Malacca. Their departure had temporarily stopped the writing of the Hikayat Melayu. So the, the writing of the Malay Annals was stopped temporarily. But his writing was later continued outside Malacca. A member of the Bandaras family must have also considered finding a sanctuary outside Malacca. Based on the present study, 
we are convinced that the original copy that became the principal source of the Hikayat Melayu or Malay Annals was written in Ajit. As shown by the Raffles Manuscript number 18, it had only 23 chapters, but as I said, it could be less. But because of interpolations by the copies from the 16th century until probably the 19th century, the final version of the Raffles 18 had produced altogether 31 chapters, which included the Blackdon's recension. The, the sentence Hatta Sultan Muhammad Shah pun memerintahkan kerajaan Bagina is an addition. The translation is, and so Sultan Mahmud Shah takes to rule the, his government. is an additional chapter after chapter 23. The manuscript written in Aceh had ended with the 23rd chapter on the Portuguese conquest of Malacca. The writing was continued in Aceh during the era of Sultan Alauddin, son of Sultan Mahmud, who ruled Johor Lama after succeeding his father in 1828 or 1829. No, no, sorry, it's not 1828, 1528 or 1529, sorry. The Achenese ruler at that time, the Malacca refugee arrived in Aceh was Sultan Ali Mogai Asha. This was the Achenese ruler. He was the founder of the Chinese Sultanate, which had its early beginning in 1496. He succeeded in uniting Aceh after having conquered Daya, Delhi, and Aru. So after the fall of Malacca, the Aceh Kingdom was just starting. The author of the Hikayat Melayu, sorry, uh, the author of the Hikayat Melayu was most likely to be the Malacca aristocrat who went to live in a district named Guha or Goa in Aceh. The Hikayat Melayu was probably written in the first three decades of the 16th century, that is after the fall of Malacca before the death of Sultan Mahmud in 2010. It was, it was written maybe between uh, 1513 or 1514 and 1530. It was written during the reign of the first Sultan of Aceh, Ali Mogayat Shah. Concerning the Hikayat Melayu, the first serious study of the Raffles Malay, Raffles Manuscript number 18 version of the Malay Annals was carried out and then published by Sir Richard Winston in 1938. But many of the European scholars who wanted to trace the origins of the Sejarah Melayu were almost unanimous in, point, in pointing out Goa in India as the original home of the manuscript. In fact, even Winston was thinking maybe because of the, the word Goa is present in the manuscript of the Raffles 18, so it could have originated from Goa because the Portuguese took the manuscript brought it to Goa. Some scholars speculated that it could also refer to Goa in Pahang, while others thought it could be Goa in Celebes or Goa in Bintan. All of them failed to recognize that, that Goa was actually Achenese Goa. The Orientalists were also baffled by the expression Orang Kaya Sogo, as I said just now, because of the age, Orang Kaya Sogo, and Orang Dari Goa. Their misunderstanding of these words had led to the serious errors in the attempt to write the origins of the Hikayat Melayu. The Achenese word Sogo, without the H, or with the H when it's uh, written down, has not been recognized by previous scholars. The Ha San, which was added to the word Sogo, had confused many people. They were also unaware that Gua, Guha, or Goa, depending on the Jawi spelling, is the name of a village or district in Aceh, not Goa in India. Concerning the word Guha, some researchers, or some researchers were even influenced by Winston's argument that the manuscript had its origins probably in Goa, India, because following Malacca's fall, it had been taken to the Portuguese colony. colony. Scholars were curious by the words Orang Dari Goa, person from Goa, mentioned in several copies of the Malay Annals, Sejarah Melayu. Their curiosity was further enhanced by the expression Orang Kaya Sogo. They never guessed that the expression, in fact, gives a clue to the authorship of the Hikayat Melayu. We are told in the Malay Annals that the Sago chief, just a 
original Achenese word, Sagwe, or the district nobleman, belonged to an elite family. He was the son of Tun Tahiruddin. This is the clue given in the manuscript number 18. The Orang Kaya Sogo, his father was Tun Tahiruddin. And he was grandson of Tun Salihuddin. This is one version. Huh? The latter was the son of Bedahara Paduka Raja, Tun Zalang Abidin. So in other words, the probable writer was somebody, a member of the Malacca elite, a descendant of the Bandara Paduka Raja, Tun Zanong Abidin. That the man named Orang Kaya Sogo was in fact the grandson of a Bandara who lived in Bukit China. No, it's not Bukit China. Sorry about it. It's Luwok China. It's not Bukit China. As a young man, the future chief of the district, he mentioned he was uh, the uh, Orang Kaya Sogo. He used to help his grandfather, his grandfather, Stone Salehuddin, who was dying, who was trying to defend Sultan Ahmad when the latter was attacked with a spear by a Portuguese soldier, this is according to the manus uh, Fakoha manuscript. But Stone Sah Salehuddin, his grandfather, was killed in the incident. The young man, on looking back, referred to himself in the Malay annals as the future Orang Kaya Sogo. Or Orang Kaya Sogo. The young great grandson of the Mandahara Paduka Raja Tun Zainal Abidin of Lubuk, China, must have left Malacca possibly, possibly between 1512 and 1515 after the downfall of Malacca to seek asylum in Aceh, not very long after Sultan Mahmud Shah and members of his family had left for Pago and then left for Pahang, where the Sultan remained for about a year before moving on to Bentayan in the vicinity of Moa. During his sojourn in Aceh, not unlike the previous author of the Malay Annals, who during an earlier period was inspired by the Hikayat Raja Pasai. The Hikayat Raja Pasai was completed around 14, in the 1490s, or the first decade of uh, first decade of 15 after 1500. That could be also to write about the fictional murder of Sultan Ahmad and Tun Ali Hati and murder of Sultan Mahmud's brother, that was uh, Zainal Abidin. The Orang Kaya Sogo must have written the Ikaya Melayu during the reign of Sultan Alauddin, son of Sultan Mahmud, who succeeded his father in 1528 or 1529. But it was not originally written in Johor. So, based on the Achenis influence, I'm saying that it was not written in Johor, as Winston thought. Based on an archaeological study, there is, an, there is information that after his succession, Alauddin left his abode in Johor for Pahang in 1528 and remained in Pahang for five years. According to the Hekai Melayu, he had also married the daughter of Pahang Sultan. He returned to Pakantua in 1533 in Johor. Nevertheless, the Orang Kaya Sogo, also known as the Orang Kaya Sogo from Guha, must have left Aceh possibly in the 1530s. See, after he migrated to Aceh, he wrote the Hikayat Melayu, and then he migrated again to Johor. And this was possibly in the 1530s. He went to Pakantuha or Pasir Raja, where the ruler was Sultan Alauddin. We think that in 1533 or 1534, the Orang Kaya Sogo went to Johor, Johor Lama, where Sultan Alauddin had established himself at Pekantuha or Pasir Raja. Today, Pasir Raja is uh, the lo location is today's Kampung Sungai Telu in Kota Tinggi. That's Pasir Raja. For then a short period in 1535, after that short period in 1535, he went to Sayung Pinang. He then moved to his Kerajaan to Batu Sawa. He was there that uh, Alauddin stayed longer. In Batu Sawa. It was in Batu Sawa that he established his Sultanate in 1536 until he was arrested by the Achenese army in 1564. The author of the Guha, the author from Guha, Orang Dari Guha, man have had the Hikayat Melayu that he wrote in Aceh it was recopied in Sayung Pinang in Johor or Batu Sawa. 
It might have been during this period that the burden, the Black Dance manuscript found in the Raffles manuscript number 18 was copied by the Orang Dari Guha in the Aceh style. So from Aceh, he went to Johlama and then he recopied the old version of the Sejarah Melayu or Hekai Melayu written in Aceh and also added the copy that Winston said the Black Dance manuscript as the integral part of the Hikayat Melayu. The binding of the Black Dance manuscript together with the version of the Hikayat Melayu that was written in the Archidist Ach style based on the original Archidist copy could have also taken place either around 1535 at Sayung Pinang of 1536 at Batu Sawa. Huh? On the very last page of the Black Dance manuscript was written the Arabic words Wa Kitabuhu Wa Kitabuhu Raja Bongsu. So Raja Bongsu is the nickname for Raja Abdullah who later became Sultan Abdullah. On, as I said, on the very last page of the Black Dance manuscript was written the Arabic words Wa Kitabuhu Raja Bongsu. Many Winstead and many local writers, Malay writers, thought that Raja Bongsu was the author because they read it as Wa Katibuhu Raja Bongsu. But actually, it's Wa Kitabuhu Raja Bongsu. It is the book of Raja Bongsu. And Raja Bongsu is a nickname for Raja Abdullah. So Raja Abdullah must have obtained a copy written in the Achini style, either in Sayung Pinang or Batu Sawar, where uh, Sultan Aluddin used to rule. It was also based on this manuscript that Raja Abdullah related his command to Ton Bambang. Many researchers think they thought that Bambang was the author of the Sejarah Melayu, including Chia Bung King also said, the late Chia Bung King, Bambang was the author of the Sejarah Melayu. No, he's not. Bambang means the knight from the mountain. He was not the author or the copies. According to the study carried out by UKM archaeologists in 2009, after the, the death of his father in 1528, Alauddin was in Pahang for five years. Eh? Is it correct? Eh? He went, and then from 1533 to 1535, he went back to Pekan Tuha, later to Sayung Pinang for a year before leaving for Batu Sawa in Jolama, where he established his kerajaan between 1536 and 1564. When the Archinists invaded Batu Sawa, Batu Sawar in 1564, Alauddin was captured and taken to Aci to face the death sentence. He was accused of having conspired with the Portuguese in Malacca and also for marrying the Queen of Aru. Aru was actually uh, a district that Achi claims to be uh, Achini's kingdom, part of Achini's kingdom. Sultan Alauddin, son of Sultan Mahmud, the second Sultan Alauddin, the, that's the first Sultan Alauddin, the second Sultan Alauddin, was Sultan Alauddin, son of Sultan Ala Jala Abdul Jalil Shah, and he ruled between 1597 and 1615. The Arabic word Allah in Arabic means exaltedness, highness, highness, prestige, or high in rank. Jala means to be, you can forget about that. Now, both Sultans Alauddin, Sultan, son of Sultan Mahmud, as well as Sultan Ala Jala Abdul Jalil, were nicknamed Marhum Mangkat Yachi. So, People who study the Sejarah Melayu think that these two Alaudins were killed in Aceh for reasons uh, only the Aceh is known. It was when Alaudin was at Pekan Tuha that the Orang Kaya Sogo Guha visited Joholama. 
The writing probably continued in the period between 1536 and 1564, but it was certainly the Archinese original text that was recopied. I think I'm repeating here. But the manuscripts might also have been written or recopied in the 1530s or after the period in mid-1613 when the nobles from Johor, including the Benara Paduka Raja, was arrested by the Archinese and then taken to Aci. And he, the Bendara Paduka Raja was said to have copied the Sejarah Melayu again. The written version of the Malay Annals was probably produced during the reign of Sultan Mansusha. But was the writer a Javanese? The Kawi expression could also have been introduced later by Tun Sri Lanang. Now, Tun Sri Lanang is a pseudonym of the Bendara Paduka Raja. Many people thought that his name was Mahmud. But actually, Mahmud or Muhammad, he also mentioned his, type, his name was Muhammad, are just nicknames. Because Mahmud means the, the highly, uh, Mahmud is the praised one or laudable one. And Muhammad, highly praised or praiseworthy one. So, Tun Sri Lanang was not the name of the copies. Nobody knows the name of the Paduka Raja. Lanang means men or gentlemen in old Javanese. The detailed descriptions in chapter 6, 7, and 8 of the Raffles Manuscript regarding the long reign of Sri Maharaja and how Raja Kasim came to power and his ascendancy to the throne as Sultan Bazar Pasha and also about the war, the war between Malacca and Kingdom Siam clearly showed that the original author of the Sejarah Melayu and others involved as the narrators of the events must have lived during the period. So that was the beginning of the Sejarah Melayu. A more complete Ikhaya Melayu was probably written after the collapse of the Malacca Sultanate. This is uh, this is a, I said, a repeat. Huh? These are the names of the Sultans of Aceh. The bad relations which Sultan Aluddin Riyad Shah, son of Sultan Mahmud, had with Aceh, was the main cause of the Aceh Johor enmity. His attempt to interfere in the political affairs of Aru, which was a dependency of Aceh, Aceh Sultan, was a root cause, especially when he took the Queen of Aru as his wife. Aceh invaded Aru in 1539. Although Aceh was defeated in 1540, the Aceh brought untold defeat to both Johor and Aru in 1564. And in 1564, Aluddin, son of Sultan Mahmud, was then captured, brought to Aceh, and then killed by the, by the Achenese. That's so why he was called Marhub Bangkat Yachi, the deceased who died in Aceh. So there are two the sultans who were nicknamed the deceased who died in Aceh. Sultan Mahmud, son of Sultan Mahmud Shah, and Sultan Aluddin, son of Sultan Mahmud Shah, and Sultan Aluddin, son of Sultan Ala Jala Abdul Jalil Shah. The Sultan of Aceh also considered Sultan Alauddin, son of Sultan Ala Jala Abdul Jalil Shah, as the enemy of Aceh because he tried to establish relations with the Portuguese. And this third Sultan Alauddin, the first one was uh, before the fall of Malacca, son of Sultan Mansur Shah. This third Sultan Alauddin was finally captured in 1615 or early 1616 and brought to Aceh to be sentenced to death. It appears that most existing copies of the Malay Annals were copied either in the Hijrah year of 1020 Hijrah or 1021, 1611 or 1612. The copies might have used the dates as symbolic to show readers that the copies made were from the original the reference manuscript number 18 was supposed to have been copied on the 12th of Rabiul Awal 1021 Hijra, equivalent to 10, 13 of May 1612. However, copies of these versions were made later in the 18th and 18th, 19th centuries upon the instruction or request of the Europeans. The dates 1020 or 1611 or 
1021 Hijrah. Witness a relatively peaceful period. So that is why the writers or the copies wrote the date 1020 Hijrah or 1021. Because they were the peaceful period in Johor. They were not disturbed by the Archonese. The last Archonese invasion took place in 1564 when Sultan Alauddin, son of Sultan Mahmud Shah, was carried off to Aceh to be sentenced to death. On 7th May 1613, the Archonese army led by Orang Kaya Raja Lelawangsa again invaded Johor Lama and members of the Johor aristocracy were taken to Aceh as prisons. Among the nobles were detained were Raja Abdullah, Bendara Paduka Raja Tun Sri Ladang and their families. By 1611 and 1612, the Sultan who ruled the Sultanate of Makam, at Makam Tauhid and later moved to Pasar Raja was Sultan Alauddin, son of Sultan Allah Jala Abdul Shah. He was about 40 then. Even though he shared the seat of government with the Raja Abdullah, he was very lazy according to report by the Dutch uh, writers. He was He, the, the, the government was taken over by Raja Abdullah. He was a co-ruler, actually, Raja Bongsu. In 1612, the Malay annals were supposed to have been copied. By 1611, the Sultan who ruled the Sultan and Makan Tauhid and later moved to Pasaraja. What is this? This is so a repeat. As a result of large-scale Archonese attack on Batu Sawa, led by Orang Kaya Raja Lela Wangsa, Batu, the Malay Kingdom of Batu Sawa was devastated. Within 29 days, Raja Abdullah and other members of the nobility, including the Badara, members of their families, were all detained and sent to Aceh. That's all. Wallahu alam, only God knows. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, Ahmad. Uh, maybe we can unshare this. Uh, the... Sorry, I have to read that. My memory power has been eroded by brain fog of long COVID. Yeah. But I don't think you've shown any sign of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are very uh, grateful for the presentation of uh, by Prof. Ahmad Adam. And uh, he's uh, trying to tell us that, look, Uh, this is the Archinist side of the story. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I think we, uh, as he's also, he has uh, been trying to tell us that uh, prior to this, uh, the present um, scholarship doesn't seem to uh, acknowledge this point. And uh, so I think that this is a very inter interesting and important point put forward by Prof. Ahmad. And uh, I think uh, let us perhaps... Uh, take some questions and comments from the from our uh from from uh, our audience we have uh 30 people on on online we uh thank you for coming and we also have about 20 people here uh in the in this meeting room so if you have any question uh, uh, please uh you can actually uh, direct it uh, to prof am adam anyone here in this room yes uh i'm daniel perez from uh, efeo uh i i noticed that uh, this uh, sujara balayu has been uh, uh studied for almost two centuries now and uh, there are still uh, many questions about this uh, very important text and it's uh, very healthy to have uh, this kind of uh, questions uh, i i am not a specialist in uh, jawi uh, or uh, malay uh, sujara malay manuscript so i i cannot uh, discuss in detail about uh, what you are uh, Uh, arguing about these uh, <clears throat> uh, problems of reading of the uh, text, but I would like to uh, to know. Uh, you mentioned this uh, manuscript uh, requested uh, or given to the Russian Navy, and uh, I would like to know what are the. Did you compare this uh, Raffles uh, manuscript with this uh, 
uh, Malacca manuscript uh, provided to the Russian uh, Navy. And, and my second question is, uh, uh, my second question is about uh, the historical context, uh, because uh, you uh, you think that uh, uh, the text was written in Aceh by the early 16th century, but we don't know, as far as I know, we don't know much about uh, what was happening in uh, Aceh at that time. And uh, Passé was uh, already weak, but still there. So uh, could you not consider also that Passé would be a place to... Uh, uh, where uh, somebody would have uh, written uh, at least part of this uh, Sajara Malayu text. Thank you. I will answer the second question. You see, Pasai, during this time, was already conquered by Aceh. So Pasai was no longer an independent kingdom. It was Aceh. So that is why the Sultan Yasna was the founder of the Achenese kingdom. <laughs> And um, the first question about uh, comparison between Rappers 18 and the Crusenstern manuscript. I call it Crusenstern because it was Crusenstern who was in Penang, actually. He worked for the East India Company. And then he went to Malacca for a holiday. Then he became interested. Somebody must be a Malay man, told him that in Malacca, this Sejarah Melayu is quite famous. So he paid three guys to copy the Sejarah Melayu. And then he took the manuscript, took it to Russia. The, cop, the manuscript was written, uh, well, was copied in 1798. Then he took it to Russia and gave it to the archivist, his friend. So that's why, and nobody knew about this. So scholars on the Sejarah Melayu also said, no, we don't know much about this until a PhD thesis was written in Russian. In Russian, I also didn't know, but a Russian lecturer here, yeah, did you similar? He told me this was done as a PhD thesis. And then where can I get the manuscript? So from the thesis, he had the thesis, the appendix, you know. Uh, so I got that. But unfortunately, somebody told me it's not complete. So one or two pages was missing. I've just written to uh, Dr. Pogadev again trying to get but it's not easy he said his friend is only the person who got the PhD based on the thesis in fact the PhD thesis I told Pogadev it's not correct even the number of chapters she mentioned she, she mentioned was not, not correct so and then I wrote I wrote the thesis uh, the, the manuscript Kursenstern manuscript uh, but it was published by this uh the Ayasan Karyawan, who abused the intellectual freedom just because I said Hang Tua didn't exist. So because of that, the chief editor refused to make changes and I couldn't sue him because I would accept accepted the royalty. That's one. Then the agreement was signed six months before the book was published. Until now, I can't edit it. I want to re-edit the book. It's very important because it will complement this Raffles 18. And I believe this Kursenstern manuscript, it was copied maybe by the Bandara Paduka Raja based on that copy, or it might have been copied earlier, but it was based on the old Achenese source also. Except that the copies in Malacca did not include the Achenese words because it just like Winstead and others, they thought as a mis those are mistakes in the Malay language. So they left out. But actually, I'm going to publish the manuscript again. All these are evidence that they were Achenis. Achenis spelling, and then Achenis words, and then the, the belief in mysticism, and why is Thursday chosen? Even though it might have been copied on Sunday, but they put Thursday. Because Thursday is supposed to be the one of the holiest days besides Friday. So Thursday is important. Is that right? Or you want to know 
comparison between the two manuscripts. What else can I explain to you? The Russian one, are they the same? No. Big, no. Because the, the Russian manuscript was copied by the Malacca. Three Malacca people. So he, maybe he altered it. Just like the Abdullah text, the Shalabi text. Shalab, in, Shal, in the Shalabi text, nothing was found. Oh. But in the Abdullah text, yes. How do you have proof that? Well, you have to read that text. The manuscript. I read them all the manuscripts. The Malacca text. I read the manuscript, the one in Russian. But but you you tell us that the uh, copyist have uh, misread the original text. But did did you read the original one? Do we have the original there one? Is no original one. Yes, unfortunately. So. But. We do in, in Malay traditional writing, the copies exercise their independence to change or to alter. So the nearest is this one, Raffles Manuscript 18. That's why we say she's the eldest, oldest text. That's the nearest. And of course, the Crusenston Manuscript can complement. If you accept that, you know, the Achenese phenomenon is not in the Crusenston Manuscript. That has been altered. From which manuscript or from which version did it draw that from? That also we don't know. But the, when the Russian, yeah. uh, when Krusensen went to Malacca, he inquired, is, this is reported, he inquired what, what is uh, the proud of, the pride of the Malacca people. And then somebody told him, this is a sejarah Melayu. So he paid money. Yeah. To have the manuscript recopied. So it was recopied in 1798. Earlier than even the Raffles 18. Because the rest were copied in the 19th century. This is earlier. That's why I say it's earlier. The Abdullah Munshi also later. Oh, thank you. Uh, let, let's move on. If it, there's any question, uh, oh. right, can I just ask a innocent question here? Oh. That uh, none of the texts, the earliest text we have is 1790s, right? It's nothing, nothing before that. Yeah. No. So how do we? I mean, I don't know that. How how do we talk about what the text was like in 1600s or 1500s? Yeah, the language. Because if you read the Trafos 18 properly, the manuscript, yeah. evidence of the Achenese influence is a lot, besides the Javanese, of course. Yeah. And as I say, the Achenese influence and the people, so many scholars have already discussed the Raffles 18, and they agree that it is the oldest because they haven't read the 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 Crescensus manuscript. They say oldest text. And I'm saying that it is not the Raffles manuscript, is based on old manuscript. And we don't know how many copies already were recopied. I mean, Oliver Walters used to talk about the, you know, the first what he imagined the first king list was like, and so forth. But we don't know, do we? All we have is a manuscript from the late eighteenth century. That's the oldest we have, right? Well, I mean, the the logically, I suppose, the Achenese elements could be put in there at the end of the eighteenth century. Or you don't, it's, it's, or are you just going on style? That it's not possible because yeah. The Achenese elements are also found in other Hikayat Melayu, Sejarah Melayu, although not so many, except for the, with the exception, uh, exception of the Shalabi attacks. Yeah. I couldn't find. But in Abdullah, yes, quite often, anything to do that ends with A, there's an H. S, sure. 
Even then, Abdullah didn't copy the whole thing. Yeah, so maybe yeah. you get it about 10 times or 20 times. But in the manuscript, in the reference manuscript, many. See, uh, when I publish it, people can see it. I remember Abdullah, something I do know, that he told the missionaries who he was working for that he just, he said, I left out things I didn't think were important in the manuscript. <laughs> yeah, in the Abdullah manuscript, you have the date. Yeah. See, some people have given wrong dates, but I think the date is 1840 or yeah. 1841. Yeah. It's 19th century. Yeah. You know? So that's 19th century. And the refers 18, what the uh, refers us to do is 19th century, maybe earlier than Abdullah. So, when, so when you say that you can see features not you, but when a scholar says you can see features from the 15th or the 16th or 17th century, that's all the only manuscript you have is late 18th century. But is this, is this judgment based on the understanding of the language? And how, how, do you, how do you talk about the, I've never understood this. I'm sorry, I'm asking a very That's innocent right. question. How can I, people talk about what was happening in that early period when your manuscript is just 1800? Well, you see, the problem in Malay literary writing, you don't have the original copies. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You don't have them. This one, I say that the source is the Ajanis copy. Because of the presence of the influences, yeah. especially the Sufi aspect. And that's interesting. Yeah. The my mystical aspect, you know. There are so many. So many. In fact, I can give a talk just on that. Hmm? So yeah, that's, many... that's really important, that point, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, That's very important point, isn't it? Yeah, I yeah. see that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And um, you see, in the Malay world, the only intellectually developed state or kingdom was Aceh, not Malacca. Malacca can only be proud, I am from Malacca, of its commerce. You know? That's good. Not culture, not intellectual, no books, no ulama, nothing in Malacca. But Aceh, yes. That's why I started by saying the Aceh, the development from 14th century. That's a revolutionary statement, isn't it? Yeah. Well, the Malacca people don't like me because I, I deny the existence of Hang Tua. I deny the existence of Hang Jebat, Hang Kusuri, Hang Lekir. All nonsense is fake. But they won't call me. I can prove to them. They won't call me. And now they are trying to send people to see that the so-called, there's a letter in Italy uh, from the Vatican about Hang Tua. It's not Hang Tua. Even the letter that they claim is only Laksamana. How do you know Laksamana is Hang Tua? There's no name. Even in the Portuguese source, there's no name. And the word Tua, the most important thing, didn't exist when the Sejarah Melayu was written. And I prove it. But Malay, English refuse to accept truth. They don't like the truth. They're angry with me. Oh, I, I'm on Facebook. I get hantam, you know, in Facebook. <laughs> Most unpopular Malay. That's <laughs> very good. Let's well, ask one more. In, in the text, it says that Malacca was the equal of Aru. Of? Aru. Aru. You're talking about Aru? It's, yeah, it says, <laughs> it says Malacca was the equal of Aru, right? Oh, Aru was a kingdom. You know, Aru, the people were better. Bata tribe says Bata. Uh, it was coveted by Achi because Aru was quite a big kingdom. It was ruled by the Permaisuri queen. Now this guy Aladdin, he was clever. He tried to orate the queen, and finally he married the queen. So Sultan of Achi was very angry. And on top of that, the queen also made friends with Portuguese. So, and the Achines were the real people who hated the Portuguese. 
They actually didn't trust the Malays. When I say Malay, I mean people in the peninsula. They didn't trust. That's why they always conquered Johor. They always attacked Johor yeah. and Perak. That's why actually, I, I'm surprised in Malay in Malaysian schools, these things are not taught. Aceh rule Perak. Aceh rule Kedah. Aceh influence Johor as uh, Selangor. I'm surprised. Nothing is mentioned. You see, and when I say Hang Tua didn't exist, they are angry. Because they, they, are trying, they say that I'm trying to deny the glory of the Malays. So they're not telling the truth. In history, that is. And this is another one. When I say, if I say hung, uh, the Hikayat Melayu was written, actually, not many people will be happy. What can the Malays be proud of? Any question from our uh, I hope the book will be out. I worked on it for two years. So, sorry. <laughs> Sorry to come back, but it's a very interesting uh, question, a uh, very interesting problem you are raising. So you, you mentioned uh, that these copists uh, were uh, free to uh, rewrite uh, the text. And so uh, could we imagine that uh, one of the copists was of Achine's origin and he just uh, modified the original text and... Uh, uh, added some uh, Achenese uh, elements uh, in, uh, in the text which was not uh, Achenese uh, originally. It... I don't understand. <laughs> but what I was saying, original copy was written actually with Achenese elements. And this is a very exam good example which people ignore, you know, the Achenese elements. Yes, but we don't have the original one. So we don't have. We don't have. So you okay from the Achenese element in the copy you you are this Raffles copy, so you think that this is the original one. But if on the other side we uh, consider that the copists were people free to uh, rewrite uh, the uh, original text. We can also imagine that uh, one of the copists was a Chinese and he just added some a Chinese elements in the in the copy. The idea of writing this or oh, re rereading is to, to I want to prove, I want to show what the history of the origins of the writing of the Hikayat Melayu. So this is one way. No, but uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Ahmad, uh, you say that we don't know which was the original. Yeah, we don't know the original. Uh, so but this, this but this one could be the no, Archimedes copy. When I say we don't know the original, what I mean is the original text. You cannot find the original text, but this, based on the contents, you know, based on the contents, this is the this is this not the original, but. But it's a copy of another copy, maybe or another copy, because that's a tradition in Malay writing. And that's why I say even the original copy. I said maybe twenty-three chapters. The last chapter being the victory of the Portuguese. Even that, I cannot be certain because people change. But definitely, this one is the product end product of the original copy written in Ajit. It cannot be written in Java. It cannot be written in Malacca because of the language presence, the language influence, and the Ajit mystics mysticism. And considering Ajit as being famous as a religious center, as a literary center, 
before the Malay is also new about Melayu. That's why you find hikayat Melayu is based on hikayat Raja Pasai. Even, the, even if the sejarah Melayu was written during the period before the conquest of the Portuguese, which I don't know, then it was also partly inspired by the hikayat Raja Pasai. I believe maybe part of it, first it was transmitted orally, and then it was written by someone about Sultan Mansur Shah's period. And then uh, you find a lot of Javanese influence. That's what I'm saying. The writer or the copy is, no, no, the copy is, the writer could be a Javanese. Because there were about 2,000 Malays in Malacca during that period. So if you say that, it could have been written during Mansur Shah's period. It would be around 1470 or thereabout. Yeah, yeah. 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 As we suggested, it could be later. Because sometimes Malays will write the event after the event. So about Sultan Mansur Shah's visit to Java, which is mythical, never occurred, never happened, it could have been written after. Uh, it was just a story, you know, created. But that person who created that must be able to read Javanese text. Like the Kehikai Hangtua. The characters in the Hikai Hangtua are mostly Javanese. Javanese names. See the word Jebat. Jebat Port Hangtua, according to the Hikai Hangtua. Jebat and, and another friend of Hangtua was Kasturi. Malays until now don't know that Jebat and Kasturi are the same person. It means perfume. Even the Laker, Laker is Lam Kapyara, which is L-K-Y-R. The author of the Sejarah Melayu, the, the, the person who wrote the Sejarah he just did to change the R to Y. So instead of Laker, it's become Lekewa. Even then, for over 200 years, people misread or mispronounced the word Lukewa as Lukyu. Lukyu is not Lukyu. It's Lukewa. Lukewa in old Javanese means the blade or the dagger. Lukyu has no meaning. And if you accept the fact that many words in the Sejarah Melayu are Javanese or Kawi, it's not surprising. Prof, we take one question from uh, on, online. We have uh, Dr. Abdurrahman Tang. Uh, Rahman, are you there? Uh, yes. Uh, please, you. Uh, if you can go ahead. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Dini. Thank you. And, oh, uh, anyhow, um, I, would like, I wish to thank uh, Prof. Adam for his uh, very fruitful uh, thought on uh, this issue. Um, um, actually, basically, I have no idea, uh, extra idea, uh, additional idea to ask, but I would like, uh, if you don't mind, I would like uh, um, um, to ask a question not related to this uh, Hikai Melayu text, but, also re but, but still related to Melaka, because you mentioned just now that uh, Melaka has no uh, no text or no, no um, intellectual um, uh, um, product uh, that we have... Uh, we have no today. Uh, in this case, I would like to ask that, what is your guesswork or your humble opinion on the existence of the Hukum Kanun Melaka? Is, was it written in the, during the time of Melaka or after the Melaka period? Um, I, I hope this this um, will, will not uh, in any way um, uh, divert from this um, um, uh, uh, topic of discussion. The Hukum Kanun Melaka is a legal code the legal code of the Malaccans, eh? where the Hukum Kanun Malacca could have existed, could have existed, but a later period. And it was written at a later period. But as I said, it's not like most Malay manuscripts. There's no evidence. No original copy of the Hukum Kanun Malacca. Yes, we, we know about Hukum Kanun Malacca. It's just legal code in any society. Even the Minangkabau have their legal code, 
But when was it written? It was written much later. And when I talk about the Hikayat Melayu, or text not found in Melaka, I said text. Huh? The Hukum Kanun Melaka was not a text. You can memorize the traditional law or the customary law. You don't have to write it. Write, you can write it later. So the Mal in Melaka, there is no trace of intellectual product of anything. No ulama. No kitab. But in Aceh, yes. Melaka can only be proud of the trade. Even I have some doubt about Melaka being an empire. I don't believe. Having read about Malay history and Melaka, Melaka was just, you know, the, the Raja maybe conquered one or two king sultanates, but it was not an empire. Like Malacca belongs to the Chinese empire. China claims Melaka to be part of its empire. But people like others or writers to talk big about the Malays. Now, there are, recently, there's one on the uh, internet claiming that the Malays have gone yeah, to faraway places and discovered so many things. It's all nonsense. See? And that is why I'm telling you, maybe if you can go and attend this forum on the 21st of November at 2.30 at the UIA. Yeah? What's the name? Yeah. ISTAC. At ISTAC, it is good. It will enlighten you. Because the idea is to expose this Fraud historians, these fake historians who try to glorify about the Malays without basis, without evidence. Okay, Raman. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, um, in that case, uh, Prof, uh, uh, according to the existing text of Pokon Kanum Laka, it was. Um, it was based on the tradition um, established during the time of um, uh, Sultan Muhammad. So, uh, okay. you, there is only that was this uh, only royal decree uh, uh, put uh, uh, put in um, oral uh, oral uh, decree, and then was copied uh, or was um, written uh, later on. Okay, so, uh, um, see, this is my first question, uh, uh, second question, but. Um, we understand. I have understood uh, what I understand from your 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 your, your presentation now is all the text the the, the current um, text actually uh, is a is a text produced either altered, uh, modified or actually improved uh, improved during uh, um, uh, by by the 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 copier itself. So in this case, um, even you refer to the original text of. Uh, uh, um, um, do you think that um, the, the question now remains that uh, um, the Sikai the Melayu was written firstly for the first time uh, uh, in Aceh and um, that we, although we don't find we, we cannot find the original uh, the, the, the first uh, the, the, the first one or the uh, copy so you still believe that it was originally from uh, what had been written in Aceh. Uh, so, uh, this is the, the, the third question. Thank you. Sorry, yeah? I never said the first Sejarah Melayu was written in Aceh. Sejarah Melayu could have been written parts of it in Melaka. But the person, the Melaka noble, or Melaka chief who went to Aceh, he was the one who wrote the bulk of the Sejarah Melayu. Maybe about the Javanese influence, about Sultan Mansusha, maybe it was written in Melaka. Maybe. But based on the study, if you study the Raffles manuscript number 18 and the language used, so the bulk of the Malay annals, Sejarah Melayu, was indeed written in Aceh. And the Sejarah Malay was copied and recopied again and again. Even in the 19th century, some, some events were added. 
So it's only the Raffles manuscript number 18 that, as Winston argued, that was written around the 1530s. And that is the time when it was before that copied in Aceh. And I said, the writer in Aceh went to Johor, he recopied and he combined probably the Black Dance manuscript and the original Achenese manuscript. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Thank you, Prof. My question, just just a, a little more on Malacca, because I see some people here with a special interest in Malacca, and they might want to press the um, the Portuguese. They do the term a Pirish talks the text does talk about the ruler talking with the ulama in Malacca. I mean, you it's a Portuguese text, and they clearly just talk to people in Malacca and got stories from the past, but it did make it sound as if there was a fairly lively Islamic atmosphere there. Mm. Um, and aren't there, aren't there parts of the Terme Parish account that are a little bit similar to, uh, to what the Malay text says? Of course, you must know when Terme Parish wrote that's that's tricky too, isn't it? Yes. We, we say also, it's fifteen hundred or something. And also, but, some yeah. people, some commentators or some researchers have mentioned that you can't trust them from your peers either. Yeah, well, Always information. Uh, but whatever it is, there were ulamas, of course. Hmm. Ulama are just people who are knowledgeable in the religion. But they're small time ulama. We don't consider that it's real ulama like the Achenese. But they talked them. They talked the ruler because around, he, didn't because they? Because he was yeah. a Portuguese. He didn't understand. He couldn't distinguish the real yeah. ulama yeah. who has a text, who wrote books. Yeah. That didn't happen in Malacca. There were ulama, of course, small time ulama. Yeah. In any Malay so Muslim society, there'll be ulama. You know. Small time, but they did convert a ruler. Right? Oh, they convert the ruler. This one, you need evidence. Uh, you, there's no evidence. Sultan Mahmud was said to be partly Indian, Tamil. Right? The Benara was Tamil. Ton Fatima was partly Tamil. That's why she's beautiful, she's Indian. She has the Indian features. That's the logic. There's no evidence. Yeah. It's not pure Malay. What's, what's pure Malay? Pardon? What is pure Malay? Uh, what is pure Malay? Exactly. You know? In fact, until today, if you go to Malacca, the present governor is half Indian. Oh, Sikh. The former chief minister during Mahathir's time, half Indian. And then, after that, some Malay politicians, the so-called Malay politicians in Malacca also. Or oh, it's not just in Malacca. You know? Not just in Malacca. But in Malacca, there are many people who look like Indian. You go to Malacca and just observe them. I'm not. I know that I have Chinese blood. And Malay blood. Hello. Yeah, uh, Professor Ahmad, uh, I am Randy, a PhD student from University of Malaya History Department. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, the the Achenis, the Achenis, Achenis. Lit uh, the Achenis literary culture and how uh, its prominence and its influences during that time. Uh, I just wonder uh, in what extent uh, the relationship between the Achenis literary culture with the Siamnis regime there. Siamnis, the, the Thai, the Siamese, Siamese, yeah. Siam. Siamese, I think uh, it's Thai, Siamese. Yeah, the, the, the interaction, is there any uh, that we can trace? Sure. 
I'm sure there would be information, but not so important. Maybe Malacca, I think, was had more closer relationship with Siam time. Aceh, you went to know, culturally, Aceh has also Indian influence. You know, the word Aceh. Any, I don't know what, but some many people agree. Comes the word Indian Tamil word Achi means sister. Achi has more Indian influence, and that is why it was uh, it had Persian influence. Shia, the, the region was closer to Shiism or oh, people from the Bazab Hanafi, not like what. The Malays practice here. Yes, Aceh had Persian influence earlier than what the Malays you see from the Arab influence. <coughs> uh, let, uh, one question from uh, uh, Mr. Wilbert, Wilbert Wong. Mr. Wong? You like Hi, to can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Um, I first learned about uh, the Hikayat uh, Melayu from no other than uh, Richard Olaf Winstead. And um, I think he said that it was uh, written in Aceh. I don't recall him ever saying that it was written in Johor, uh, unless it's from an uh, earlier version of his work. Uh, can you clarify? Thank you. As I say, the bulk of the Hikayat Melayu was written Aji. And then the person, the evidence you can find in the Sejarah Melayu itself, the Hikayat was brought by Orang Dari Goa or Orang Kaya Goa. That's from Aceh. So the Achenis came to Johor. Achenis is also the Malacca fellow. The Malacca guy who went to Aceh, who wrote the Hikayat Melayu, and after that, he went in the 1530s, he went to Johor. And that's why in the Sejarah Melayu is written, the Hikayat brought by the person from Goa, from Aceh. That's another evidence which I forgot to tell. So in Johor, it was just copies. Just like I was telling the Kursensen manuscript, was written, uh, was copied in Malacca. So that's possible. From Aceh, you go to Johor, and then you recopy the edition. There might also be changes in the chapters. And then combined with eight chapters of the Blackden manuscript, even then, that could have been done later, not necessarily in the 1530s, the Blackden manuscript. It could have been done uh, later in sixty after six, middle middle of sixteen thirty, by the Madara Paduka Raja, and the Madara Paduka Raja being in Aceh, he also could have copied in the Achenis time. But definitely, the Madara Paduka Raja's name was not Ton Sri Lana. This must be dismissed because there's a belief in Malay society, traditional belief, you cannot. Reveal your name. It's always that's why you don't you won't know the name of the author. Even the Raja, when he becomes Raja, he has to change his name. Sultan Mahmud's name was not Mahmud. His name was Mamad, then it changed to Mahmud. So as a belief in, in, in Malay society, you your name is sacred. You cannot reveal it. So Ton Sri Lanang is not the name of the Benar Padua Keraja. This must be corrected. Lanang means men. When he says Lanang, Ton Sri Lanang, Gelar Muhammad, means the praiseworthy man. Thank you, Paul. I, I, think, I think we have uh, covered from enough for this afternoon. And uh, I think we have gained much from the perspective that has been put forward. And I, I think uh, we have 
learn much from the interaction also. Uh, of course, we all have questions. We all are uh, going to leave this place with uh, many questions. Uh, but we, this is one view, that one important view that has been put forward by Prof. Am Adam. And I think it is only right for all of us to thank him in the usual manner. Thank you, yeah, thank you very much. Well, we, uh, on behalf of the uh, society, uh, we, it is my... For our friends online, I'm I'm sorry that we have uh, come to an end.